so pleased to be with you tonight. Um, very often, we'd love to have you on Kirtland Air Force Base, which I'll get into in a moment, to show you around our laboratories in person. Um, that's not obviously going to happen this year quite so easily. And frankly, it doesn't happen at 6 o'clock at night anyway. And so um, we'll show you a little bit about what we do. Uh, I'll describe some things, then we'll show you some videos and whatnot and talk through some of the research we do and why it's important, uh, hopefully for the defense of our country, but also to, to New Mexicans. So what I'd like to do as well is share my screen. Um, let me see if I can find the right window here. I just want to give you a couple of slides, first of all. The Air Force is famous for showing slides. I don't want to do that to you. But I wanted to just sort of orient you a little bit about our laboratory and where we are in the state of New Mexico. I'm not sure everyone here is from New Mexico even. That's what's great about virtual, or certainly not from Albuquerque. But I've got up, hopefully you can see, a map of the United States um, to talk a little bit about our laboratory, AFRL. I'm not sure we can and, see it, Matt. I don't know if it's because I pinned you, but... So it should be filling the whole screen now? Yeah, okay, I unpinned you and I can see it. So if anyone's... Okay. Only map because they pinned them, unpin them. Uh, I've got a couple of different slides, and, and I don't look any different throughout the slides, so it's probably best not to look at me. So we're the science and technology arm of the United States Air Force and the Space Force, which is a new thing. You may have heard of, uh, you know, it's not just a Netflix movie. There actually is a new Space Force looking to use space to help defend our country. And our laboratory does all the science and technology to create those new systems. What I think is really cool is that even though we're a big laboratory and we've got locations all across the country, you can kind of see that on this map, our second biggest location is right here in Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base, just south of the airport. And so we've got about 2,000 people working there, mostly on space technology and something called directed energy, which is frankly a fancy word for lasers most of the time. So that's what I wanted to show you a little bit about tonight. Um, if we were on base, I, I switched to a map of the U.S. Thanks, Google Maps. If we were, um, if you were visiting in person, it'd be a lot easier to orient you right to where we are. But I thought I'd try this set of, 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 of map shots here to show that, of course, we're in New Mexico and, and we're located right south of Albuquerque, uh, right near the Albuquerque International Sunport. And so, as I switch to um, the uh, sort of photograph, if you will, of, of that region. Um, you'll see that the outlined portion in black there that I drew, it's kind of squiggly, is really where Kirtland Air Force Base is. It's a very large Air Force Base with all sorts of different things going on. Uh, on this location, you may have heard of Sandia National Laboratories. that they're, that They share the base with AFRL and a whole bunch of other folks. What I find interesting as well is that, as you probably know, New Mexico is a very large state physically. And, and that location, this very small part of the state is actually larger, Kirtland Air Force Base is larger than, uh, than Washington, D.C., uh, which I find fascinating. For those who've been to Washington, it seems huge, got the, all sorts of different capital buildings and whatnot, but uh, Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico is, is even bigger than that. So kind of drilling down a little farther, our portion of our research lab on the base is just right near the airport, near the Sunport. I zoomed in again, so hopefully you're not getting too dizzy. And near the uh, Air Pharrell locations here in the airport, um, we have a couple different places we do research. One of them's right by the airport, and it's that building down in the right-hand corner there, and that's where we do our laser research. I should pause to breathe and see if there's any questions yet. And I can't see the chat, so maybe Oscar or Caitlin can help me if there's something important I go into now. Yeah, I'm but monitoring the chat. You are, Oscar? I am. So if Thank anyone you. has any questions, feel free to add them to the chat, and, uh, and I can interrupt Matt. So I want to talk about our, our laser work for a few minutes, and then Oscar is going to tell you about our satellite and space work that happens sort of on the other corner of this particular graphic. So I don't know if you all know this, but New Mexico has been the leading location for laser research for many, many decades, down at White Sands Missile Range, uh, Los Alamos, San Diego, and a lot of work from the Air Force. And you might wonder, well, why in the world would the Air Force be all that interested in lasers on airplanes? And so I included this one chart from AFRL that describes what we're trying to do. And it's kind of a wordy chart with a few numbers on it. But basically what we're trying to do is put lasers, high power lasers we call them, on airplanes um, to defend those airplanes from attack. You can imagine in some sort of a conflict in the future, right, if someone was angry with us in the Air Force, right, they might shoot missiles at us. And currently, we would defeat those with other missiles. That gets to be a whole lot of missiles and, and not a lot of fun. And so what we'd like to do in the Air Force is shoot down those missiles with high-power lasers. And on the next slide, in my last slide, I think, I'll show you what we mean by a high-power laser. Because you don't do that with just any laser pointer. It takes a really special technology to be able to defeat something like a missile uh, with a modern laser. 
So there's going to be a little math on this chart, so watch out. I want to give you just one more slide that kind of describes what we talk about by a high power laser. On the left, you actually- um, We do have a quick comment in the chat. Um, they're not able to see the left side of the slide. No, way, cut that off. is not helpful. Hang on. It looks like it might be in some kind of presentation mode. So actually, now we can see the whole slide. So if you want to just keep it kind of in this view, I think that would work fine. That's really great feedback. I had not heard that before, so thank you. Um, so hopefully you can see the common laser pointer on the left-hand side. Um, and, and that's that's the kind of laser that you see maybe most often. Um, it, it actually um, has a power level uh, and it comes out in watts, just like your light bulb. And that power level is 0 0.002 watts. And if that sounds small, it, it kind of is. But it still comes with a warning label. It actually can still damage eyes. So, so those are common and they're a little bit dangerous. That's, that's what you see most often, maybe around at the household or at school with lasers. So if you wanted a, frankly, better laser, a bigger laser, you'd have to go a thousand times more powerful. And it's still a laser you can buy. You shouldn't, but you could. And that's a two-watt laser, and that's in that middle picture. And Dr. Martinez and I, Oscar and I, we frequently do demonstrations with this kind of laser. And it's pretty powerful. It's pretty dangerous. It can burn through paper. It can burn your skin if you're not careful. But in order to get a laser that's really high power and big enough to do something that the Air Force wants to do, like shoot down missiles, you'd have to go a thousand times more powerful. And that's what's on the right-hand side. And I'll show you a little bit more about that kind of a laser by going into one of our laboratories here at AFRL. I'm doing the air quotes, going into one of our laboratories, because of course, we're, we're not, we're not going to do it in person. But hopefully our, our cool video will, uh, will show you what, what we're up to here. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen for just a moment and switch to a video of one of our high power laser labs. And I've never figured out how to do this quickly, or while talking for that matter. But let me go to here. So this is a still, but it soon will be a photograph. Hopefully you can see our fiber laser lab. Um, and this is one of the kinds of laboratories that we have at the Air Force Research Lab here in Albuquerque. We've got dozens of these types of labs, but this one works on high power lasers called fiber lasers. And let me start playing this video and show you where the laser is. So these two gentlemen um, work at AFRL, and you can see they've got goggles on. That's to protect their eyes, because this laser is so powerful that, of course, if you, if you got the laser shown directly into your eyes, it would damage them. Um, but even a reflection could actually be dangerous. And so they're using a special piece of equipment to look at the light. So moving forward, in this very complex optics lab, the laser is actually that thing in the middle. It's that circular thing that has all those, maybe they're violet colored fibers running around. And what happens is electricity goes into those fibers, essentially, and the, the light that gets created, not a whole lot different maybe than the light that gets created from one of your LED light bulbs, gets amplified and it gets, um, we call it um, aligned and focused. It gets more and more powerful going around there until it essentially shoots out the other end. And so you get a little bit better view there of the fiber with the laser light inside of it. That's the kind of laser that we actually are creating for aircraft. This is my friend Imelda. One of the other challenges is those lasers have a lot of heat. They put out a lot of heat energy. They also get hot themselves. And so we have a lot of technology to cool those lasers so they actually don't melt themselves. That's what she's working on. And then these are some of the uh, Air Force officers um, that work on the, on the base. They're scientists as well in this kind of technology. So when we show people lasers in person or virtually, we get a lot of questions about, well, what kind of things can these big high power lasers burn through? I already talked a little bit about missiles. That's what we were planning to shoot down with these lasers from airplanes. But they can actually burn through a lot of stuff. If you've ever seen a movie, maybe a Star Wars movie or uh, even a James Bond movie, sometimes when things get hit with lasers in the movies, they just explode. That's not really usually what happens. It's more like welding. And so when I play this video, hopefully you'll be able to see just a short clip here of pieces flying off of the metal that the target is actually made out of. You see those big metal flakes. Those are actually hunks of metal that have um, been heated up and are basically being blown off of this metal plate. And that's kind of what happens with the laser. The laser just kind of continues to burn through pieces of metal until it gets all the way through. So often when we do these um, presentations or show people the lasers on base, I get lots of questions about, well, can a laser burn through this? Or can this laser burn through that? 
and, and it gets kind of complicated, but in general, what ends up happening is if, if an object is um, able to absorb light, that means maybe it's dark in color, uh, and it's, it's relatively lightweight, um, it's like something like paper, then it's really easy for the laser to burn through that. If the object that's the target is reflective, like it's shiny, and it reflects that light away, then it's a little harder for the laser to affect it. Also, if the object's really, really massive, think like concrete or a big rock, right? There's so much matter there that it's very difficult for the laser to actually burn through it and blow it up. And so that's kind of a good rule of thumb. But even this laser can, 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 burn, through, um, can burn through metal. The last thing I wanted to show you about lasers, and I can take any questions, is sort of a live shot of a laser burning through, um, it's a coin, it's a commemorative challenge coin, we call it in the Air Force. And as I start this, what you'll see is the laser actually going through a lens and starting to hit the metal. You might even actually be able to hear it, I'm not so sure. But this is how long it takes for the laser to burn through the paint on the outside of the metal and start burning through the actual metal of this thick coin. It takes quite a while. So now the laser is actually melting the metal inside of that coin, kind of the inner layers, if you will. And the last thing you'll see here in just a moment is when the laser breaks through and goes to the backside of the coin, and it's actually burning the paint on the backside. Matt, I actually have a question for you. Yeah. Um, a question that on the surface sounds a little simple, but knowing a little bit about physics is maybe um, a little more involved. Um, so when you buy one of those those pen lasers and you know the toy store, um, they're typically red, and um, you know we learn in school you have the rainbow. There's the different uh, spectrum of colors um, that correlate in physics to different wavelengths. So I was wondering, um, what color is this laser? What kind of effect does that have? That, that's, that's a really excellent question, Caitlin. The color matters a lot. The color actually comes from the method used to create the light. And so for a lot of um, what we used to use, like gas lasers, they would come out a beautiful red color or a green color or even a blue color in the case of argon ion lasers. That's kind of the chemicals that were used to actually create the light. These days, so many of these electrically driven lasers, they come out in colors you can't actually see, right? They're kind of red, but they're so red your eye can't see them. They're infrared lasers, right? And, um, and that makes them um, more powerful, which is great because those colors produce a lot of power, but they actually produce a lot of other challenges to, to, to make them work. Um, so it's kind of fun. You actually can't even see this laser um, unless unless some other things happen. Oh, my, my mute button was dancing away from me. Sorry. Um, I actually have one more quick question. Um, so the way that lasers work, does it make a difference being on Earth or in space? That is an interesting thing about lasers. Actually being in space works better. So we talked about how uh, things like even paper can stop a laser a little bit, and certainly a rock or big pieces of metal stops lasers. But guess what else stops the laser? So does air, you know, over a period of time. Clouds are a big problem with lasers as well. And so it actually works much, much better in space. The light doesn't need any air to propagate, right? Um, light goes just fine in the vacuum of space. And so actually lasers are, are more attractive to use in space. The, the good news is most days no one's shooting at us in space. And so we don't currently plan to have any lasers in space. Uh, aircraft is, is our main focus. So a uh, good question. We have a question in the chat, actually. A question from Emma, age 10. Is the laser so fast that you can't see it? It, it? it would be. If we turn the laser on and off really quickly, it would be so fast that you can't see it. It goes at the speed of light. But most of the time, we leave the laser beam on. And you actually can see it as long as something reflects that light back into your eye. Right? It's kind of a weird thing. The, the light comes out of the laser. And unless something is pushing a piece of that laser light back into your eye, like the smoke you saw was doing that, 
Um, sometimes we do videos where we put little water droplets in the laser beam and that reflects back into your eye, right? Th then, then you can see it. Uh, otherwise, it, lasers are really difficult to see. Again, I kind of laugh at the movies. When you see lasers in the movies, sometimes they shoot the laser and it comes out really slow, kind of like, usually there's sound effects too, right? That doesn't really happen. It comes out very, very quickly. The other thing, you can always see the laser beam in the movies. Well, you can't really see that in real life unless there's something that, that is um, reflecting portions of that laser beam back into your, into your eyeballs. I think a good way I like to think about that is um, a flashlight shining it into the fog. You can see it in the fog, but you can't actually see the flashlight if you were shining it, you know, just into the air. You see the object that is being lit up by the by the flashlight. You can see the light bulb itself, but you don't see anything in the middle unless there's something there. Yeah, and that's what I think cats like about it, right? If you ever use a laser pointer with a cat, the, the cat often just sees the little dot of light maybe on the floor or on a wall, and they think that it's pretty cool to play with. I don't think they see the light going from the, the laser pointer to the wall either because there's nothing there to... To, to show it to you. All right, well, if there's any other laser questions, think about them, put them in the chat. I wanted to turn this over to Oscar, who's gonna talk about the other big thing we do here in New Mexico, which by the way, we're the only place that does this kind of space research in the world, certainly in the country. He's gonna talk about our space research next. Yay, it's my turn. Yay, I'm gonna stop sharing too, because- I know people can uh, respond with thumbs up or anything like that, but I am now going to present and share my screen. So appreciate the feedback if you guys can or cannot see what I think you should be able to see. Um, I am now going to go to a picture of a lab that we're about to go to. Can anyone see this? Yes. Great. What is it? Just to make sure I know what it is. <laughs> the AFRL building. Great. Okay. That's exactly what I want you to see. So this is the front of a building. It's a relatively new building. Uh, it actually was, it, it sprung up right before I got here. Most of the research going on in this building started off in Massachusetts and, uh, and moved here not long, after, not long before I got here back in 2013. And so this is what they call, in military speak, the Battle Space Environment Laboratory. And in short, this is actually one of the Space Force's buildings now. And inside occurs a lot of research pertaining to space. So <clears throat> along the back side of this building is a huge corridor um, with uh, most of the research that I was affiliated with. So this is you know, physical chemistry, research concerning sort of the environment of space, the chemistry, the physics, of the space environment. And you might ask why we're concerned with that sort of thing. Well, it's because we have a lot of assets, things up in space, things like satellites and so forth. So now I am going to go inside of that building and go inside a laboratory that we call the Spacecraft Charging Lab. And that has an acronym that's contrived that is SICKLE. Spacecraft Charging Lab. You can you can kind of envision how they, they got that from that name. Anyways, this is, uh, I, I paused the video. We skipped the first portion. I hope you can see a still of the video. Can you verify that? Anyone? Yep, we see yes, the chamber. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's a big chamber. It's a vacuum chamber. Uh, it's kind of gross. I just noticed it's got like little drippy things in there. That's probably from checking leaks. Because in a big chamber like this, I, I mentioned it's a vacuum chamber. And so you have a lot of pumping and stuff that are, you know, pumps that are attached to this that draw out all the air and, uh, and create a big vacuum. And so that the vacuum is relative to atmosphere. Um, it's about a million to a billion times less pressure. Okay, so you have, you have way, way fewer molecules and atoms in there. Of course, you can see that we're introducing something, and I'll get to that shortly. Uh, but again, relative to it, the outside environment, there is a very, very low pressure near what we would consider near vacuum, right? Near space vacuum type vacuum um, in a chamber. And this is a pretty big chamber. It's about maybe six feet wide, eight to 10 feet de in depth. Um, so it's pretty huge. And if you wanna seal something up like this, typically in this case, this is a door that would swing out. We're looking at a door. You can see the handle 
right here. I'm going to leave my mouse so you can see where it's hovering. It's a handle. They would pull the door and it would swing out. And it's got a big rubber gasket. And, and that gasket is what's used to make the seal. And of course, if you have any problems, uh, then you squirt things like alcohol or something uh, that you can then see a response of to help you find where that leak is. Anyways, back to this. I'm going to start the movie and you're going to see what looks like a lightsaber in there. Now we're looking through that window directly inside of the chamber. And so this is a plasma. And so in, in short, we're introducing a gas and then we're discharging into that gas or using some microwaves to excite the molecules in that gas and ripping off electrons and creating a plasma. The plasma, of course, because it, it's composed of charged particles, responds to magnets, a magnetic field. And if I continue playing this, uh, earlier you might have seen these big copper looking coils and shortly you'll be able to see them again. But those are in fact electromagnets. They're huge electromagnets. And so anytime you pump current or if you flow electrons through a wire, for example, though that flow of electrons will create a magnetic field. And in this case, uh, all of the charged particles that are in this beam are then concentrated and then modulated or moved around by, by changing magnetic field. And so here, if I pause here, this is the little tube that's connected to the gas flow and they can use a variety of gases to create different types of plasmas and so forth. And then uh, here we have two capabilities to actually create a plasma. You can, you can barely see this, it's kind of blurry, but I'm gonna leave my, 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 my mouse hovering over an electrode you would attach a high voltage electrode that would create a discharge and that would create the plasma in the flow of gas. What this guy's holding in his hand is a pretty neat little device. It's, a, it's essentially a really mini microwave gun. And that microwave will excite the molecules and make them rotate amazingly fast, fast enough to essentially rip off your, their electrons and create a plasma. Uh, and then that plasma goes in here and then you saw the effects of that plasma. Uh, this is one of our scientists, Pat, Dr. Patrick Roddy. He's one of my, one of my friends, uh, and he looks kind of like a, like a geek, because he is, and so am I. We're all geeks, and we love being geeks. Uh, but you can see he's, you know, he's working on a computer that you really can't see what he's doing, but there's a lot of equipment affiliated with those chambers and the things, you know, things that you have to uh, move or uh, you know, currents that you have to adjust, you know, many, many adjustments that need to be made with equipment like that. So here, my other friend is, is leaning on the Helmholtz coil here. Uh, and if I continue playing it, you can, you can see what the size of the chamber is. You can see all the ports that are associated with the chamber. Of course, all of these are capped right now, but they're, uh, they're, they're meant to be able to, uh, you know, introduced to the chamber a variety of things anything from like maybe sensors to pressure monitors to um a variety of things that you'd want to be able to put into that vacuum environment and that might also give you indications on the experiment that you're working on and then of course as we continue the video here's the help big helmholtz coils um again big currents flow through those and they create a big magnetic field and that magnetic field condenses the plasma because it's responsive to uh, magnetism. And that is it for this video. Again, feel free to drop any questions in the comments and someone I'm sure will let me know that they exist and then I can answer them as we keep going. So now we're gonna go. I've actually got a quick question, yeah, sure. Oscar. Um, so when I was in college, um, we talked about vacuums a bit. And so one thing we did is we had a much, much smaller setup to make a vacuum, but we put a marshmallow in it. So yeah. I would like to know, did you ever put a marshmallow in that vacuum? No, you want to know why? Because you end up having to clean all that stuff out. And that's not necessarily fun. In other vacuums where I didn't care if it got dirty, then yes. but. Relatively speaking, uh, you have different types of vacuum chambers. Some you consider dirty, but even some of the dirtiest, you don't want to put stuff like that because uh, if, if there's anything that is potentially what we would call outgassing in that, that marshmallow or whatever you put in there, 
it might stay around for a really, really long time and might affect your experiments for a really, really long time. Especially like the last lab that I'll get to, it's a really sensitive lab. And if, even if you had like something that had a little tiny bit of water, and I, I'm talking about very, very like parts per million, that could affect your, your, your you know, instrument sensitivity and, and your uh, experimentation considerably. Matt, did you have something to add? Were you saying something? Well, Caitlin, I haven't done that. What happened? I'd imagine that marshmallow without the pressure pushing on it probably got pretty big, didn't it? Yeah, yeah it expands. <laughs> we, we do that in our stem out. We have a specific chamber that's a dirty chamber, and you can't tell it's dirty, but we would consider it dirty experimentally. Um, but yeah, you, you can put ma uh, a marshmallow in there. What other things? People put in foam. It's especially cool when it's a peep because then you get to see the little the little chick or the little bunny getting really big. But we right. actually have a, a, a chat, another one from Emma. Um, Emma's asking, why do you suck out all the air? So again, a lot of the experiments, and I was going to say one more thing about that. Uh, a lot of those chambers, similar to the one that you saw there, are available to experiment on materials that we would put in space. And so we want to recreate the space environment as best as possible on Earth. And to do that, we know space is not a complete vacuum, but we get it as close as we can to the similar conditions. And then, and then we expose some of those materials to other conditions besides the vacuums that they would uh, experience in space. Things like radiation or certain light sources, um, and then see what happens to them. See if, if they last as long as we would hope they would last, that sort of thing. Because uh, then we know what to use and what not to use. And, uh, but again, the, the reason we draw the vacuum is uh, to, to recreate the space environment as best as possible for that scientific uh, experiment. So now we're, we've moved on to another lab. This lab here makes very fancy, very accurate, precise uh, clocks. And they're called atomic clocks. And it's a specialized type of atomic clock. And the reason they make these clocks is because things like GPS rely on this clocking mechanism to give very, very, very accurate results when you want to find out where on Earth you are. So we have a bunch of satellites up in space, and those satellites send down signals, including timing. And your device, like a phone or a GPS device, uh, interprets those signals and gives you a location of where you are on Earth. And the more accuracy you can insert into that, then the better you can identify exactly where your position is. So the clocks that they're used to are, are you know, they have limit in how accurate they are, number one, but they're also relatively big, right? So they, they require a certain size to be put onto a, a satellite. And if we can make those better and if we can make them smaller, That'd be great. And so that's one of the things that this lab here is focusing on. And by the way, this, this picture to start on the still is, can, I, can anyone guess what these things are? They're tiny Helmholtz coils. Anyways, these, this, this, this lab here uses specific properties of certain atoms, um, elements, to essentially get them really, 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 really cold. And in doing so, they use the properties of these atoms, little oscillations and things that they would pick out uh, with lasers. They, they, they also kind of uh, maintain them and freeze them, so to speak, with lasers, get them really, really cold. Um, anyways, when you do that, the, the precision, the accuracy uh, for the timing that you get, the information, the timing information you get from these gets better. And in doing that, then the challenge is to kind of put this into a system that we can then potentially use in things like, um, you know, again, spacecraft or satellites or possibly even planes. So if I continue playing the video here, this is one of our interns. All of these are interns, by the way, except for one, and I'll, I'll let you guess which one. But this intern here is showing you a chip that she made. And again, it, we zoom in here. Um, this is made from a silicone wafer that is covered with these copper sheets. And you'll see in the next, in the next image, um, we're all pause, that uh, there's a specific machine that'll mill away all of the copper sheet where you don't want it and leave it where you do want it. And in essence, right here, where, where it's left, you end up creating wires. 
And then these holes are where you can insert a variety of things, anything from like, you know, maybe computer chips or whatever is necessary to complete this experiment. But this, this here also helps produce a magnetic field. This is in effect a tiny, tiny little electromagnet. And so that's part of one of the things that they use to, uh, again, control these atoms to get the specific information they require from them to produce way better clocks. This is the one guy that is not an intern. He's a captain. Of course, I think Matt might have mentioned that our workforce is, is broadly composed of civilian people like Matt and I, uh, people in the military like this captain here. Um, and, and so it's, it's not necessarily, you know, Matt and I are not in the Air Force, but we work for the Air Force. So anyways, this is the machine. It's a lathe that produces the thing that I just showed you earlier, the little chip that our intern was holding. Another thing to point out is our interns do a variety of things, but one of the important things that they work on, no matter what, is programming. And here you see, you know, this guy's coding here. Uh, this young lady over here is working on, you know, an actual physical uh, setup of the experiment. Same here. There's some we coding. We have a question in the chat. Anna wants to know what what does the chip do again? So that chip, two things, right? Um, it, it essentially then becomes a computer board, right? Like or a printed circuit board type thing, a PCB, they would call it equivalent. And um, you can attach to that uh, a variety of components that you might need, be it sensors or anything, but also depending on how it was machined, and, and you notice the one here, if I go back to it, had a certain pattern. This pattern can also produce a very specific magnetic field, and that magnetic field can come into play to, uh, to help out the experiment. And so now if we go back here, again, programming, I wanted to emphasize programming is key. Here's another angle of a variety of students. A lot of them are doing programming. <clears throat> Even if they're working on um, a, a physical experiment, and this is probably true in most of our labs, programming is always an asset. And so they're, um, they're working away on, on building either, you know, sensor detection or a variety of things that can use programming skills to enhance the experiment. Sometimes they even use things like Raspberry Pis. I'm sure a few of you have probably, you know, goofed around with the Raspberry Pi, but they're they're actually pretty useful in the lab. So you should be proud if you know how to use a Raspberry Pi. And if you don't know what one is, look one up or equivalents and have fun. Get started because they're they're amazing. They're marvelous. They're fun to play with, but they actually have some real, real, real value. Again, a lot of our interns. And, and they're co-working with our scientists and engineers. They're co-working with our, our military. Uh, they're working with each other. So our look into our AFRL scholars, Air Force Research Lab Scholars Program. Uh, we offer internships that are very, very valuable and super fun, super cool, and great experience. Now we're going to go to the last lab here. This is my favorite lab, mainly because this is the lab that I came to work on here. I heard, I heard something. Did someone have something to say? Question, comment, anything? Um, nope, I think we're good so far on questions okay, right. in the chat. I'll right. let you know if any pop up. So this is the space chemistry lab, and this is one of the labs, again, that I worked on here uh, at, at my arrival. And so here, uh, Jenny Sanchez and Nick Schumann are working on, this is called a, a FALP, uh, and that's a flowing afterglow Langmuir probe. And what it does is it senses, um, electron densities based on chemistry that is occurring you might if you if you look closely you might hold and you, you'll get a different angle or a little, little later when i play the video um but he's holding in his hand and to fine tuning one of those microwave cavities that i that i mentioned earlier but this this shows you that for this is kind of actually a very simple experiment but it's, it has a lot of stuff associated with it so back here you can see a pressure gauge over here, you have a flow meter. Flow meters are actually really cool. Um, they they can deliver a very very specific flow in terms of density of, of a gas, um, and that is very important because again, that value, the accuracy in that value, goes into the accuracy of the experimental result. But then you see things like little variac, um, uh, a bunch of other flow meters. Here's a computer, and if I start playing bunch of valves for gases. So again, here's a glass tube. 
this always makes me very nervous because again, there's, there's pretty much a vacuum in there. We are introducing gas, but that gas is uh, still, the relative pressure is, is still really, really great, right? And so in here, it's, you'd still consider it pretty much a vacuum. Uh, and, and if you were to crack that, you'd have a catastrophe. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit more about catastrophes in a little bit. But see, he's... Can you, um, can you explain to us um, really quickly why that, that creates a problem, that there's a vacuum inside the glass if the so, glass happens to crack? Yeah, so uh, again, that relative pressure, right? So you'd have a sudden inrush of uh, atmospheric air. And typically, you have a variety of com pumping components that just can't handle that. In this case, this instrument has what we call uh, turbo pumps. And these are essentially, think of jet engines. Jet engines, however, are, are designed to be able to deal with those types of pressures. These jet engines are designed for very, very low, low pressure. And so you have these turbines, it's a turbine, spinning at 40,000 rotations per minute, 40,000 RPMs, okay? And uh, they're, they, they range in size. Sometimes they're just a few inches wide to uh, potentially tens of inches wide or some of the bigger ones that I've seen. If you have a spinning blade, think of even just a fan, okay? A fan blade spinning at 40,000 revolutions per minute. And all of a sudden you go from vacuum to atmosphere, you introduce that pressure, that's the catastrophe. So these things just get obliterated. They, 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 they hit the air or the air hits them, vice versa, right? So hard that they just tear themselves apart. And these things aren't cheap, right? They're on the order of a few thousand, a few tens of thousands, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's something that makes me nervous is when, because it's happened. It, it's happened uh, not, not the, on this instrument to me, but other instruments and in on this instrument, every instrument, is pot has potentially had its its catastrophe, and so you try to avoid that whenever possible. But that's that's science. But you still try to be responsible because there's a lot of, you know, that sets you back also uh, in terms of making progress on an experiment. You might be, for example, making progress, and then if a catastrophe like that happens, you have to clean out the experiment. You have to clean out the system, and 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 by cleaning, I mean as as I mentioned earlier, even having small amounts of like water or something like that can really, really set you back on your results because these instruments are really sensitive. And so uh, that could set you back a lot of time, not just money. So here, Jenny. So Ben wants careful. to Go know, uh, does it hurt the people or just the equipment? No, it doesn't hurt the people. Catastrophe catastrophe. Except for making the people cry because you know how much time and money is, is involved in what just happened. <laughs> so, um, but no, it isn't hurt the people. I mean, yes, potentially, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, glass might fly or something like that. So, but, but for the most part, um, that glass would go in the direction of the flow and that flow is going to push it towards the low vacuum side. So it's not necessarily going to fly out. It's going to fly in. It's going to implode. Does that make sense? Everyone knows what explosions are. That's where something creates so much pressure, it pushes out. In this case, most of the pressure is already outside, so it pushes in. And I was using my hands, but you guys obviously did not see that. So does that answer your question? I'm gonna assume that's a yes. If no, feel free to interrupt. Um, yep, we got a yes. Awesome, awesome. Again, I mentioned that whole water principle, right? Water was one of the big ones. And so, and we're talking about such small concentrations of water. Well, sometimes we have clever tricks to deal with that. And so in this case, uh, this, this gentleman here, Sean Ard, is pouring some liquid nitrogen into um, um, a little container here. And what you see here, you see the, the coil. I don't, I don't know how fast to move my mouse so that you can actually see what I'm doing. But if you follow that pipe, that pipe goes into that trap, we call it, and then coils around. In essence, altogether, that whole thing is a trap. And so the liquid nitrogen, what it does as, as we use, even though we use very, very pure gases, sometimes again, as I mentioned, small con contaminants can really ruin your experiment. We further purify those really, really high, ultra high purity gases 
by running them through a trap like this and the ultra cold liquid nitrogen freezes out things like water, uh, oxygen. And so, and you can see there's a series of them. So uh, now we've since progressed from this old school method to um, they've, they've developed in the past few years, much better filters. And now we can filter the gas even better and better and better. But um, that was one of the cool ways. This is a cool zoom out here because again, um, she's, she's modifying the experiment. You can start to see all of the control systems for the flow meters, some, some voltage meters, some pressure meters. And then of course, here's the computers. All, all of the stuff you see here is home programmed, right? So we programmed um, some, some programs essentially to read the readings from sensors and then do maybe some calculations and so forth to make determinations that matter scientifically, right? The results that we actually want to report to journals. And so here on the left, on the left screen here, this is a mass spectrum. So it's showing you a uh, mass, uh, you know, intensity versus the, the size of a molecule. And so we can determine with, with you know, absolute certainty what molecules were flowing through and, and, um, and monitoring in the end. And then of course, if we sit on any of these peaks and introduce other gases and things, you'll see how those peaks end up changing in size. And if we monitor that by knowing the concentration of other things that we're introducing or time and stuff like that, we can get a lot of valuable information. And, and of course, this is pertinent because things in space have to deal with ions and molecules um, and electrons. And there's a lot of chemistry involved in terms of how it affects the longevity uh, of a given material in space or how it affects a spacecraft or oftentimes these sort of things affect communications, right? Everyone knows that like when the space shuttle was coming back in, what would happen? There's that blackout period, right? Because it's coming in, it starts hitting the atmosphere at a super, super duper speed. And that produces a lot of friction and that friction ionizes the gas around the spacecraft. And that ionization creates an impedance on the communications. And so if we understood that better, all the chemistry and how all that works, we can utilize that to our advantage and maybe overcome that sort of problem or maybe improve communications from one side of the globe to the other, uh, a variety of things like that. So anyways, um, here he is filling the liquid nitrogen up from these big doers. These are about 160 liters. Here's the obligatory up in the right, right hand corner here, the obligatory uh, periodic table. Um, and of course he's wearing all the proper safety equipment. So splash shield, some cold gloves, a cold apron. And this is a, this is a, you know, the slow motion B roll that never gets old, right? Slow motion B roll of a liquid nitrogen fill. So how about I pause now for any questions? And if we'd like, I've got a few other things I can share if necessary. <clears throat> um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead, type them in the chat. Meanwhile, um, let me... So, this is one of the ways, by the way, that we, we use one of the means, one of the physical um, components of an experiment that we use to measure the mass of an atom or a molecule. So these things are called quadrupoles. There's other things like octopoles and hexapoles. Anyways, these create a very, very balanced uh, combination of magnetic, electromagnetic field that oscillates and allows the way it's run uh, at very high frequency that, that's tailored to the masses that you're looking at, it allows only certain masses to get to through the entire thing, okay? And if you, if you do this in a very controlled way, you can sweep through masses and then coupled to that, at the end of that, uh, you have this little device here, which is called an electron multiplier. Those ions or electrons that make it through, that you allow to make through, because you're sweeping through different masses by using uh, controlled mechanisms on the device I just showed you, high voltages, ultra high frequency, and you're oscillating to create these, these magnetic fields that 
uh, again, control those ions. Those, those ions then do what we call impinge. They impinge on this material here. Uh, this material is very special. They hit the material, in, all, in other words. But it's a very special material. So when an ion or an electron hits that, it causes electrons to be ejected from that site. And because of the way it's designed, those electrons get funneled in. And each time one of those electrons hits the side of this, you create more electrons. So you have approximately one ion or one electron coming in and hitting here. And by the time you're done coming out on this end, you have a current that's been magnified 1 million times. Well, that's a current you can detect. And so in essence, this is the detector for ions and electrons and coupled to what I showed you earlier, that, that quadrupole, that produces an instrument that can, it's called a mass spectrometer. And that's what we use to weigh out ions or molecules, right? Atoms or molecules. So long as they have a charge, we can do that sort of thing. So that to me is pretty fascinating because an atom or a molecule does not weigh that much, right? Eat the smallest ones, of course. There's some big ones that can weigh a lot, but all right, how about I pause again? Any questions come in? Um, we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, but if anybody has any, feel free to jump in. Can I uh, Oscar and Matt have some pretty cool jobs. So, you know, uh, if you want to ask about that, that'd be pretty cool too. Yeah, absolutely. We invite questions about our jobs, careers. Um, and then just, just, I guess as a background, I can talk while if, if anyone has any questions. Um, I, uh, let's see, I, I finished my undergraduate school uh, at the University of Baltimore in Maryland. That was after I was actually in the Air Force. I'm no longer in the Air Force. I work for the Air Force. That's just a coincidence. Uh, and, and in the past, I was coincidentally also just a Russian linguist. But I went back to school, got my degree, and I went to graduate school at University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, and that's where I studied physical chemistry and I got into astrochemistry and astrophysics. And then from there, I went to a postdoc at Harvard at the Center for Astrophysics and got to use a, a bunch of fun other type of instruments that I wasn't used to. So I did microwave spectroscopy. And earlier when I mentioned that microwaves cause molecules to rotate, right? They, they, uh, they, they, they can do several things. Light in general, electromagnetic spectrum can be absorbed or emitted by matter. And it's that property that we utilize to do a field of chemistry and physics called spectroscopy. And so if you understand what's going on in that absorption of light or emission of light and you detect that, then you can find out a lot about molecules and the chemistry that's going on. And so in that lab, we'd create a lot of high energy molecules that we'd expect to find in space. And then we'd go use uh, radio telescopes, which use microwaves and, and other uh, very, very similar frequencies to detect molecules and, and things in space, right? And then we'd study the chemistry of that. And we can get a lot of useful information. We can get information regarding um, the shape of the molecule, the length of the bonds, uh, the angles of the bonds, a whole bunch of very useful information that then can give you more information regarding how that molecule, for example, might react with other molecules. So <clears throat> a lot of that is also very useful here because we end up using a lot of the same information and using programs that simulate a lot of that same information again to figure out what sort of chemistry is of concern uh, to the Air Force in this instance, right? So one of my fun examples is, is we use these molecular modeling simulation programs to get enough accurate information about how a molecule is going to behave to determine what sort of chemical properties it'll have. And so one of the fun ones is uh, there, there's a thing in chemistry called a catalyst. A catalyst is uh, a reactant that doesn't get used up, right? It, it helps out the reaction, make sure the reaction occurs efficiently, but then it stays around for the next reaction. It doesn't get used up as a reactant becoming a product that's totally different, right? It stays around and gets used up. Anyways, we use a lot of specific metals in combustion. So think about aircraft, jet engines, and so forth. We put in 
certain things like metals to make that reaction occur more efficiently to give us more uh, energy from that reaction so that we can harness it and make the, the aircraft move or make the rocket move and so forth. Anyways, one of the things that we were just looking at in this lab is it turns out that that's very, you, you get very specific boosts in energy based on the size in terms of atoms of those molecules. And so the specific example is aluminum. Aluminum has these clusters. So think about aluminum, uh, you know, maybe 10 aluminum atoms or 11 aluminum atoms or 12 and so forth. It turns out 13 aluminum atoms together is kind of a magic cluster. And that's actually what it's called in the literature. And that number of atoms together for many reasons makes a reaction occur combustion wise with oxygen much more efficiently than giving you more energy output. And so if, you know, from the molecular, right, from the atomic or molecular level, we can find out so many things that can then, in, you know, influence the, what we call the macroscopic level or the bulk level. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, all right, go ahead. Uh, here, I, I can go to the chat. So, yes, is that a question, Ben Newton? I'm joking. No, so we've got... Do we have any? We've got um, Alexander is asking, when do you think we will be able to travel to Mars and make a civilization? Well, people are, are actively pursuing this, right? Not necessarily the Air Force. Uh, uh, there, there might be certain advantages for the Air Force, but that's more of a commercial venture where uh, you have people like Elon Musk and a bunch of other commercial ventures trying to pursue that sort of thing. Of, of course, eventually that ends up becoming um reality then yes absolutely it, it becomes a lot more important to um to, to have so, some sort of play in there for the air force does that make sense Matt, yeah. what about the um the work that you're doing right now um you mentioned you know working on improving communication so do the things that you work on have an impact potentially on travel to mars in the future yeah, one of one of the interesting ones is the lab right next to mine worked on these things called um, uh, you know, uh, plasma thrusters, and so they they use specific properties of uh, ions, right? You know, using fundamental principles of physics. If, if you have an ion and you push on it, well, it pushes back on you, and the the thrust from a single ion or even maybe a few small ions isn't that much but it's it's a cheap efficient way where collectively you can build on that thrust to eventually get to faster and faster speeds to get to very very long distances cheaply so, so that's right i think it's it's interesting to point out that um some of the technologies that afl has been working on recently are actually on their way to mars um the most recent mars mission has it's either solar cells or uh, processors that are headed to mars having said that you know i i um it's really technically challenging to go to Mars um, and, and to be effective there and to be safe there. And so um, I think it's going to be a little bit, to answer the question from Alexander more directly, I think it's going to be a while before we get there. Uh, and I think uh, I think it's going to be great when we do. I also want to interrupt to get to, to, to Ben's question about how does AFRL's interaction with the new Space Force work, because um, that comes up a lot. And I think it's really neat to point out that um, our workforce, our, our team members right now actually do work for the Space Force. And so the Space Force really owns all the space science and technology uh, for the Department of the Air Force. And so we actually have a tremendous Space Force presence right here in Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base right now. Um, and again, sort of the lead technology for the Space Force is being developed by AFRL and our partners in other organizations right here at Kirtland Air Force Base. So I wanted to get a plug in for that. Go Space Force. Also, the second season's coming out, not that I'm counting on Netflix pretty soon. Do we have any more questions in the chat? We're coming up on, on 7 p.m., so you know, folks might have to get going, but be happy to take some, some more questions if you have them.
All right, while we kind of wait for maybe a few last minute questions to come in, um, I'm going to post a link in the chat to a feedback form. Um, we're collecting some feedback for the Science Fiesta events that happen. Um, it really helps us out, it's quick to do, and you get entered into raffles for some cool prizes. So I'm putting that link in there as well. Um, Danielle. And I'll go ahead. No, oh, sorry, Caitlin. Danielle, I see a, a comment there, um, a question. Do we offer oh, it for in the summer? Absolutely. Please, if you don't mind, Google AFRL Scholars, or uh, I can do the same and just put a link in here if I can do this in time. In there, you will see um, the locations you can center on Kirtland Air Force Base, and that is our, our location here for AFRL New Mexico. Uh, and from there, you should be able to find opportunities for educators. Similarly, we also have our um, STEM Outreach Program. There's a STEM Outreach Academy. If you go to AFRLNM.com, you can explore our STEM Outreach webpage. And in that, you can find a variety of information for teachers, including professional development or many other activities that we offer to um, the state of New Mexico and beyond. So does that answer your question? I hope. I think I got lost now in my icons. And... Oscar, Oscar, I put a link to the scholars in the chat. Thank you, thank you. You think it'd be easy to find a link and talk at the same time, but I cannot manage it. So I know. No, you know what happened is you know how a bar down below uh, the 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 tasker bar sometimes moves on you and, and provides several levels. Well, it moved to a different level, and I couldn't find it. So, um, anyways, that's my problem, not anyone else's. Back to you, Caitlin. All right. Um, so thank you so much for um, for joining us, everybody in the chat. And thank you so much for presenting, Oscar and Matt. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed and, and learned a little something about what AFRL is up to. Um, I want to invite you to check out the rest of uh, New Mexico Science Fiesta. We've got some other fun events coming up. On Saturday, we have our big Science Fiesta Expo, which is going to be a ton of fun. Um, we've got live programming. Um, there's going to be prizes and possibly explosions. So I hope to see everybody there. Um, and one more time, there's that feedback link both in the chat and on the graphic that I'm sharing. Could win some pretty cool prizes, just saying. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful night. Um, and if you do have any last minute questions, you wanna throw them in the chat, um, we can either answer them now or I can uh, forward them on to Oscar and Matt to respond to at a later time. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.